We don't talk much about Jesus' ascension into heaven. I'm glad Clayton asked me to because it's become precious to me. I don't know if he even knew that, but by God's providence, here we are. Most of us evangelicals hardly notice it. Everything important to us seems to happen either before or after it. Atonement we associate with the cross. Apologetics with the resurrection. Spirituality and church life with Pentecost. Future hope with the second coming. And increasingly, we, we associate mission with Jesus' earthly proclamation of God's kingdom. The ascension seems like a creedal and liturgical place filler, not an essential event of Christ's redemptive history. But the Bible teaches otherwise. Jesus' ascension into heaven is integral to the new humanity we become in him. Taking another look at the ascension makes the full glory of our salvation shine more brightly, both what we have already received and what we still wait for. As we read of the ascended Lord in Ephesians 1 today, three broader biblical questions arise. What happened? How does it affect us? And what are we waiting for? First, to find out what happened, we begin in Acts 1. Jesus tells the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. The disciples respond by asking when he will finish restoring God's kingdom to Israel. One of the things that struck me in watching the dance this morning, I don't know if the dancers intended this, but what struck me is the sheer surprise, the interruption, the shock of the ascension. Jesus, in some ways, answers the disciples' question by leaving, and I don't think they were quite ready for that. He tells them not to worry about timing, but to focus on power for witness. Then he is taken up before their very eyes into a cloud, as they are gazing after him, trying to figure out what's going on, two angels appear with the promise, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. But looking up at this event from the human side is not enough. Ephesians 1 helps us to see the other, the divine perspective on the story, that it is God exerting the Spirit's incomparably great power when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The passage goes on to relate three related actions to the aftermath of Christ's resurrection. Number one, God seated him at his right hand. That is, he returned the Son to the divine preeminence over every other name that he enjoyed before becoming incarnate. Two, God placed all things under his feet. The Father reestablished cosmic sovereignty while reorienting how it is exercised. Now it is exercised through what the Son has accomplished in his mission. And three, God appointed him sovereign head with special reference to the church by which he begins to express the fullness of his rule in the world. So, what happened in the ascension? Jesus visibly marked the end of his earthly descent in the incarnation. Having risen up from the grave, now he completed that trajectory of his divinely vindicated mission. As he ascended, he proclaimed victory over all hostile spiritual forces, according to 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. This proclamation of victory reassures suffering believers that God will someday vindicate them. The D-Day victory is already won, even if we are still waiting for the final surrender. The ascension is the counterpoint of the descent into hell. Whatever the church precisely means by that phrase, at the very least, she speaks of the Son of God experiencing all the deadly estrangement from God that we sinners deserve instead. No enemy can defeat the Spirit's resurrecting power. That is the message of the ascension and its reversal of the descent into hell. Jesus' ascension involves not simply the end of his earthly ministry or the event of the Father returning him to his rightfully exalted place. What's new about this event as well is the Father exalting the Son as the God-man. For Jesus to share in kurios, Lord, 
the New Testament equivalent of Yahweh, the name of God, of Israel's God, that is above every other name, according to Isaiah and Philippians and elsewhere. This doesn't merely return him to divine glory. It also inaugurates the exaltation of humanity in him fulfilling our hopes of participating in a creaturely way in the divine rule. Just as Jesus' resurrection was the first fruits of a new humanity, so Jesus' exaltation extends that trajectory to indicate the fullness of our destiny. God seated him at his right hand, God placed all things under his divine and human feet, and God appointed him head over the church, the new humanity, that inaugurates the new creation and awaits its fullness. Which points to our second question, how does the ascension affect us now? It inaugurates what theologians call the heavenly session in which Christ rules over his people, the regathered form of Israel we call church, extending his cosmic reign through those people. Thus the church experiences tension between Jesus' presence and his absence, between Christ already reigning while not yet reigning in fullness. Our Ephesians passage emphasizes the already. God has placed all things under his feet. The epistle to the Hebrews and the book of Revelation emphasize the not yet. Even if Jesus is crowned with glory and honor since he tasted death for everyone, not everything is fully under his feet yet. The ascension of Christ's body reassures us that our human flesh participates in this new creation. It too matters, even as in our flesh we now experience Christ's absence from earth. Today's most significant theologian of the ascension, Douglas Farrow, has detailed the consequences of neglecting this absence of Christ. When the church only glories in proclaiming Christ's presence, she becomes too triumphant about her earthly influence. She claims to possess and to mediate Christ's presence too exclusively and too extensively. She becomes obsessed with political power or overly systematic about her sacraments or obsessed with the spiritual power of her members' individual inward piety. Even Ephesians recalls Jesus' absence when it celebrates his presence. It speaks in chapter 1, verse 18, of being called to hope, of anticipating a glorious inheritance, still future, awaiting the age to come, chapter 1, verse 21, and farther back of times still needing to reach fulfillment, chapter 1, verse 10 of the Holy Spirit serving as a guarantee, chapter 1, verse 14, of something we're waiting for. So, upon Jesus' absence, we experience a new form of divine presence. The Holy Spirit's indwelling power, it is less embodied, but in another way, it can make God seem more immediate, more intimate. The divine presence also becomes more extensive since the Spirit can bring anyone near to Christ or Christ near to anyone. Whereas if Christ remained embodied on earth, that presence would in a sense be localized and thereby limited. So we need to acknowledge Christ's absence while celebrating the new form of presence we experience by the Spirit. Meanwhile, that's on earth, Meanwhile, what's going on in heaven? Well, the ascension focuses also on the heavenly presentation of Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice. This heavenly presentation inaugurates Jesus' ongoing ministry of intercession for us. We can draw near to God with boldness because we come in Christ. Our humanity participates in his When the church fails to acknowledge the human presence of Christ with God the Father, she tends to fear that he is too divine to be of earthly saving good. She weaves in additional, more human, more approachable mediators, Mary, the saints, and so on, who can threaten to displace the one mediator between God and humanity, Jesus Christ. 
But if faithful covenant partnership is always already presented to God in Jesus Christ, then our prayer can participate in his heavenly adoration of the Father. His intercession becomes the basis of all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms that Ephesians celebrates. The exaltation of Christ's humanity in the ascension not only signals our reconciliation, it helps to enact it. So thirdly, what are we waiting for? Parts of that answer have already surfaced. We're waiting for the second coming, when all things will be fully under Christ's feet, and we will commune with him face to face, marveling at the same time at the marks of his wounds for us, which will still be there. In short, we're waiting for the fullness of the new creation, enjoying the fellowship in God's presence for which we were made. But embedded in this third question is a mystery that we can't answer. Where is Jesus? That mystery helps us to appreciate the significance of new creation. On the one hand, God is spirit. It shouldn't surprise us that modern scientific exploration hasn't found heaven located somewhere in physical space. We just don't know specifically where the embodied son is. Jesus went up because he couldn't go farther down physically and because he had already gone down spiritually. The ascension completed and reversed the descent of earthly incarnation. And God's transcendence, the fact that heaven isn't simply somewhere else, but actually signals God's governing presence everywhere without being exhausted anywhere, God's transcendence makes going up metaphorically appropriate as Christ, in a sense, rejoins the fullness of participation in that governing presence. And the drama of the Bible incorporates numerous ups and downs. Most crucially, Jesus comes down at birth and goes down into the waters of baptism, going up to Jerusalem for his passion and death, undergoing various ups and downs of human trial in between. Jesus goes down to hell and then ascends to heaven with resurrection in between. And Jesus ultimately will descend in glory so that he may raise up the entire cosmos to glory with the last judgment in between. So we can't treat heaven like some place that snugly fits into our current cosmology. Heaven more dramatically reorients our entire picture of creation's ups and downs. On the other hand, we're understandably curious about this where is Jesus question. If the ascension is a physical event, changing Jesus' relation to earthly history without him giving up his resurrected body, then he has to be somewhere, not because God has a right hand, but because Jesus is the divine son who is God's right-hand man. The point, then, is that we don't know exactly where Jesus is. He lives in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, yes. He lives as God in the presence of the Father, yes. But he also lives as human in a new creation we cannot yet see. Yet this new creation involves bodies in place, heaven coming down to transform earth, creating a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The ascension helps us to realize that focusing too much on place, on the where question, is a distraction. Focusing on time, however, has us fixing our eyes on Jesus as the embodied pioneer of the new creation. It's yet to arrive in fullness, but it's coming. Then we shall see him, and then we shall be like him. Over and over again, historically, Christians slide away from this truth toward body-denying or body-serving Gnosticism, toward ascension in the mind, not in the flesh, one moment we serve our bodies and we seek cultural comfort, the next moment we treat those bodies like they have no spiritual value. Overly inward spirituality, ascension only of the mind, plays out both ways, sometimes simultaneously. It's not that the mind is unimportant or that our spiritual lives should just be about going through external motions. But as Ephesians reminds us, the ascension has to do with Christ's fullness filling everything in every way. He ascended in transformed flesh, precisely because we don't know 
where Christ now is, the Spirit calls us to wait in hope for the new creation. We ask him to open the eyes of our hearts to see all things under the feet of the one we long to see face to face. And in the meantime, the Lord's Supper gives us a little periodic foretaste of what it will mean to share in the fullness of the heavenly communion. How then should we respond to these biblical sketches of Christ's ascension? Often American Christians expect a sermon to tell us what to do. Maybe you don't expect that from a theology professor, <laughs> but in theory, that's what you might often expect. And there's a place for that. When Paul mentions, again in Ephesians 2, 6, that God has seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ, he soon points in Ephesians 2, 10 to the good works that God created us for and has now made us alive to do. Moreover, within today's text, the ascension reforms how we pray for ourselves and others, leading us to ask that the Holy Spirit would do what he alone can do to shine the light that makes visible the incredible riches we share in Christ. In light of the ascension, we see that we are forgiven in Christ as he presents his sacrifice in heaven for us. We are welcomed before God in Christ as he presents human adoration for us. We are indwelt and empowered by the spirit he has poured out upon us while we are awaiting the full spoils of a victory he has already made secure. No hostile power, not sin, not sickness, not death, not the devil, can triumph over us, for he has divinely descended into our hell and humanly ascended into heaven as our pioneer. But in that light, it seems to me that if we would be true to Ephesians' depiction of the ascension, then our primary response is not to figure out what else we need to do, but our primary response is to gush with grateful praise. Rejoice, the Lord is King. 